Aho, greetings, my relatives. Welcome to another program, Eagle and the Condor. And today we will be talking about uh, California Indian issues. Uh, in fact, we have a super video uh, called Exterminate Them, the California Story. And it was uh, produced, uh, directed, and narrated by Floyd Red Crow Westerman, our good friend who passed on Spirit World, but uh, he left uh, many uh, videos such as this that we'll see on the second half of today's uh, program. And my relatives, we've been hearing a lot uh, these days uh, on the border, the southern border with uh, California and Mexico and Arizona, and it's really getting militarized, so we have to uh, keep our eyes there, and uh, we're seeing the uh, families that are still being separated. The children are being separated uh, from their moms and dads and put in cages, which is outrageous. And uh, uh, we're also being bombarded on TV these days uh, with the impeachment proceedings, uh, which uh, for our part, yours and mine, is to be sure we're registered to vote, okay? So November 2020 is a big time uh, for many of us. And also the 2020 uh, U.S. Census is very important to us and the American Indian community. So be sure we are all counted. And there is a category there uh, for self-identification. So if, if, you, if you know that you're Indian, you feel you're Indian, that's between you and Great Spirit, and that's where self-identification comes in. So you mark on that category, indigenous person, okay? And uh, we do have uh, with us our co-host, uh, uh, Jolene uh, Crawford. Yes. And Jolene, uh, uh, we spoke last time in our mm -hmm. last show a little bit about yourself, but uh, let's, uh, let's uh, tell the listeners once again a little bit about yourself and... Uh, you know, uh, how uh, we'll proceed from here. All right. Yeah, Jolene Crawford, uh, born in Oakland, raised in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I, I'm currently registered with the Pomo tribe in Northern California, Robinson Rancheria. And I have seven kids, one boy and six girls. So, um, yeah, and um, so, I'll be co-hosting with you, uh -huh. hopefully for for a while here. <laughs> All right, no, that's terrific. I look forward to many more yes. uh, experiences that we'll have here on yes. on and this show. So please, uh, you want to proceed with the calendar reading? Yes, I can do that. All so right, we have the Bay Area Indian Calendar for 2020. Thanks to the American Indian Contemporary Arts for the calendar. Upcoming events exhibit now until January 31st, 2020. Indigenous Futurisms, Explorations in Art and Play, Indigenous Futurisms Envision Native Futures, Indigenous Hopes and Dreams Recovered by Rethinking the Past in, an, in a New Framework. And you can see Grace Dillon, 2016, at the C.N. Gorman Museum in Davis. The exhibition brings together graphics, comics, science fiction, and gameplay to create a provocative space and engagement thought about indigenous futures and possibilities. Uh, in cultural knowledge, works by visual arts explore graphics, Gaming and superheroes. Game designers engage with language, role, play, strategy, and cooperative play to create new world in computer, tabletop, and card games. Ongoing Alcatraz events to June 2022. New Industries Buildings exhibit Red Power on Alcatraz Perspectives 50 Years Later. In 1969, a group of Native American activists called the Indians of all tribes arrived on Alcatraz. Red Power on Alcatraz Perspectives 50 years later tells the story of their 19-month occupation on the island. 
uh, cultural programs second Saturdays of each month. During the occupation, Native American activists called for an Indian cultural center on Alcatraz Island. Um, in keeping with this idea, cultural programs and activities will take place the second Saturday of each month from December 2019 to June 2022. Visitors can participate in a variety of presentations, workshops, demonstrations, and activities led by former occupation of Native American groups. Check the National Park Service Alcatraz events calendar for current lists of programs. Uh, Saturday, February 8th, the ninth annual Bay Area American Indian Two Spirits exhibit to restore and recover the role of Two-Spirit people with the American Indian First Nations community by creating a forum for the spiritual, cultural, and artistic expressions of Two-Spirit people. This is the largest Two-Spirit powwow in the world. You can learn more at www.baaits.org. Sunday, February 9th, and March and March 8th, Indigenous Red Market, 11 a.m. to 5 p.m., 3124 International Boulevard in Oakland. Typically, every first Sunday of the month, the Indigenous Red Market was born in September 2018 to bring together Indigenous peoples every month in Oakland. Indigenous vendors share their artwork and food items, and, and Indigenous musicians perform contemporary or traditional music. You can learn more about that at www.indigenousredmarket.com. Okay, and so we also have a, um, a panel on the cultural and ecological of Juristac. Join us for a panel discussion about Juristac and Ecology Sensitivity Ancient Ceremonial Site located south of Gilroy. And that's going to be Thursday, January 30th from 5 to 7 at the Martin Luther King Library, room 255. Your speakers are going to include Valentin Lopez, and he is uh, the Amu Mutsun Tribal Band, mm -hmm. and Alice Kaufman. She's committee for the Green Foothills. And we also have Dr. Stuart Weiss, the Creekside Science. And we're going to go to Tony real quick for another announcement. All right. And uh, that would be the Red and Blues uh, Benefit Concert for AIM West. And that will be in Santa Cruz on February 27th. We have plenty of time for that. But uh, we have some good bands and uh, a good program. Uh, February 27th, by the way, is Wounded Knee Day uh, in uh, 1973, where uh, members of American Indian Movement and others uh, took uh, a village uh, Wounded Knee uh, in uh, uh, February 27th and uh, held it for uh, 71 days, as many of you uh, might recall. And so uh, February 27th will be... Uh, commemorating what uh, 48 uh, years of uh, when that occurred and uh, we're also going to have the Red Blues musical concert Santa Cruz and that will be at the Veterans Hall uh, in, San, in uh, Santa Cruz and coupled with that uh, that will be at uh, doors open at 630 till 10 o'clock and we hope to have or we will have the Bobby Young Project, uh, it's a group from out of uh, Oakland on the East Bay across here, and also another group called the Funkanuts. And uh, the Funkanuts uh, are well known here in the Bay Area, and we're going to give them some time to tune up down in Santa Cruz. We will have a special guest, and that will be uh, Lenny Foster, who's a spiritual advisor uh, for Leonard Peltier. Uh, being held in prison now 44 years. And Lenny Foster is also a veteran of Wounded Knee of 73. We'll have other Wounded Knee veterans there giving testimony 
of their experience in that time. Also, uh, February 27th in San Francisco, in the afternoon, we'll have a noon rally at 450 Golden Gate Street at the Department of Justice building. Uh, we invite the ecumenical and the interfaith groups and many others to join us from 12 to 1 o'clock there. And we'll also have uh, Lenny Foster with us to honor us with prayer as we commemorate Undini and uh, the veterans and those that uh, that uh, didn't come out of wounded knee that passed on. Uh, so stay tuned to that and back to Jolene. Okay, so we have a uh, intertribal friendship house monthly update. They're going to have a mini powwow on February 6, 2020 from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, mini powwow and potluck and bring your healthiest dish to share and that address is 523 international boulevard oakland california 94606 and also they're going to have a drum and dance practice um, that that is every thursday they have a potluck from six to nine um, please bring a dish to share with everyone here are some ideas they won't they got salads, casseroles, fruits, vegetables, lasagnas, juices, no soda, please. Uh, wild rice, bread, traditional and cultural dishes. Once again, that address is 523 International Boulevard, Oakland, California, 94606. And back to you, Tony. All right. Well, thank you very much. And my relatives, uh, be sure to listen in at uh, KPFA Radio in Berkeley on uh, Wednesdays uh, from 7 to 8 o'clock p.m. We have Bay Native Circle, and I uh, uh, host a radio show there. And I've also invited Jolene to help me in that radio show as well. And for now, it's on the first Wednesday of the month, and hopefully uh, we may make some changes on that. But uh, tune in on uh, Bay Native Circle, KPFA Radio, 94.1 FM uh, on your dial. And also, the uh, tell your friends about uh, uh, Eagle and the Condor. This is a word of mouth. This is the only way we, we are able to, to get the word out to people that we're on the air. And we bring you uh, news and information, uh, video documentaries. Uh, and we interview people that are in the, coming in the Bay Area. And uh, if, so if there's issues or announcements as well that, uh, that you have, please uh, mail them or send them to us. Uh, you can go to the website of AIM West at www.aim-west.org for more information, particularly in February, as I mentioned, the uh, Santa Cruz uh, Red and Blues musical concert and in solidarity with Wounded Knee, and in San Francisco, the Noon Rally on the 27th at 450 Golden Gate Street, the Department of Justice building, uh, to let them know that uh, there are still over 60 uh, men and women who who died uh, 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 and their uh, their uh, investigation well there has not been investigation on them and this is the period that we call the reign of terror shortly after a wounded knee as I mentioned that began February the 27th for 71 days uh, the next two years from 73 on to 76 uh, after Wounded Knee, uh, over 60, 65 men and women were killed, and uh, there has not been an investigation. So we're going to read off those names at that noon uh, rally on February the 27th. And also, uh, my relatives, you should know that uh, the San Bruno Unified uh, School District uh, Last uh, Wednesday, 
had a school board meeting and they sold 20 acres from this school district uh, for about uh, 79 uh, million dollars uh, to a developer and uh, you know bones of our ancestors were found there in 1968 so we have to uh, look at this carefully uh, and who these developers are now because the school district voted to sell that 20 acres so we'll be uh, investigating uh, the uh, that sale and see uh, about those bones that were found there uh, this could be considered a sacred site, and there are uh, there are uh, regulations, and certainly the California Native American Heritage Commission would be interested in knowing uh, more about that sale that went down. So we'll keep you posted on that mm -hmm. on future uh, TV shows here, uh, in, including with uh, the radio at KPFA. Uh, 94.1 FM that I uh, mentioned to you as well. I just wanted to uh, maybe ask uh, Jolene, is anything in California uh, uh, that's coming up or that you're concerned about that uh, you might want to talk about later on on, on uh, any of our future programs? Sure. I, I think um, I'm doing uh, a little investigating on the disenrollments and what, you know, what maybe uh, steps people can take, you know, like I know that uh, our tribe had re-enrolled, uh, you know, like 68 uh, tribal members. So, you know, I, I wanted to maybe give a little, you know, step yes. by step in how we did that. Uh -huh. So because uh, is that the, the tribe is uh, Robinson Rancheria, at Robinson Rancheria, Northern California. And you yes. were disenrolled. I was one of the ones that and were disenrolled. And you recovered. Before. Yes. As well as others that were disenrolled yes in 2016 we were we were disenrolled in 2010 no 2012 and then re-enrolled in 2016 so it took quite a while uh -huh. but, but we did it so. yeah no I'd like to talk more about that yes. you know for our future yeah yeah you know programmings and uh, and your people here in California suffered the brunt Mm -hmm. of the manifest destiny the, right. from the the European settlers as they move from the east yes moving west they refine the art of killing and oh, yeah. and uh, separating families and uh, extermination and uh, the video that we're going to see mm -hmm. and thank you Jolene yes. the video that uh, we're going to see once again uh, is exterminate them the California story and uh, narrated, produced, directed by Floyd Red Crow Westerman, passed on years, several years ago, but uh, left uh, a, uh, a program, a documentary that is really soul searching and can vividly describe uh, what went on here with mm -hmm. uh, Jolene and many of the California people here, you know, such as the missions that uh, were created here by the Spanish, uh, led by Junipero uh, Serra. And, and uh, we have a church, one of those churches, one of those missions right here in San Francisco, uh, Mission uh, Dolores. And, uh, but uh, this is the film that uh, we bring, uh, and news and information that uh, we will bring you with Exterminate Them and uh, we hope to have other documentary videos to show you of the experience that California Indian people uh, had uh, lived through and are still you know, with us today. So my relatives, uh, on behalf of Jolene, I want to thank you for coming in. Thank you, Tony. And uh, we'll see you once again on Eagle and the Condor. Hello, 
My name is Floyd Red Crow Westerman. I'm of the Dakota Sioux Nation. It is my honor to present segments from the first installment of an important new docu-series called America's War on Indian Nations. What happened to the indigenous peoples of this country is much like the Jewish Holocaust. Only America's ethnic cleansing was at the hands of people who would later claim innocence in the name of God, freedom, and democracy. Historians have been reluctant to use the word Holocaust to describe the taking of the land and the shaping of America. Instead, they use rhetoric like the new frontier or claim that the Indians were savage after all or describe it as manifest destiny. Manifest destiny means that the taking of the land was not only justified, but ordained by God. Most schools in America still teach this feel-good version of history. America's war on Indian nations tells another side of the story. This series will tell the truth about gross injustices and rampant human rights violations inflicted upon an entire culture. Early day Europeans who came to America were commissioned to look for gold. With gold the objective meant that nothing would stand in their way. State by state, various tools of genocide were employed in what became a systematic clearing of the land. The first of these tools was the bullet. The bullet was used to kill many millions of my people. Another tool of genocide was the smallpox infected blanket. To Indians, the blanket was a dominant trade item. To give a blanket was a gesture of respect. Knowing this, early Americans distributed smallpox blankets in order to exterminate and eradicate the existing population. Those who survived this early form of biological warfare were removed by organized government-funded militias and more bullets. Imagine being in your home having dinner with your family when suddenly armed intruders break in and shoot your parents, take your children, burn your house, the children to be later used as servants and sex slaves. And if you survive that, to be rounded up like cattle and put on death marches to remote locations far from your homeland and put on reservations, a nicer term for what they really were, concentration camps. This horrific scenario is what happened to thousands and thousands, if not millions, of Indian people. For my ancestors, the Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota, this policy of concentration camp lifestyle was in effect from 1890 to 1930. For 40 years, my people were prohibited by law from leaving the reservations. The ethnic cleansing was effective. It is estimated that when Columbus arrived, there were approximately 20 million Indians in America. By the end of World War II, only 500,000 remained. This means that complete extermination was nearly accomplished. Listen to the words of some of the founding fathers of this country. George Washington, revered as the father of this country, wrote, and I quote, Indians were wolves and beasts who deserved nothing from the whites but total ruin. Thomas Jefferson, acclaimed proponent of freedom and democracy, argued that the United States government was obliged, and I quote, to pursue Indians to extermination or to drive them to new seats beyond our reach. Andrew Jackson, founder of the modern Democratic Party and the greatest Indian killer of all American presidents, urged United States troops, and I quote, to rout out from their dens and kill Indian women and their whelps. It is a great irony that American Indians, after being denied for many years their right to practice their own religion, speak their own languages, after being forced to live in the oppressive concentration camp lifestyles, after all that, 
Indians have gone on to become staunch defenders of this country in times of need. More Indians have received the Congressional Medal of Honor per capita than any other group of people. We remain a proud people in spite of the efforts to exterminate us. In order to heal, we first must accept our past. And now excerpts from part one, Exterminate Them, the California Story. In 1851, the first governor of California, Peter Burnett, wrote in a subsequent inaugural speech that a war of extermination will be waged between the two races until the Indian race becomes extinct. And in 1850, the first legislature of California enacted a law under the guise of protecting Indians titled, An Act for the Government and Protection of Indians. In section 20 of the law, it defined vagrant Indians and prescribed their punishment. It stated that any Indian able to work and support himself, who shall be found loitering and strolling about or frequenting public places, shall be liable to be arrested on the complaint of any resident citizen of the county. It was for, and I quote, champions of the Christian faith to invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever, and other enemies of Christ wheresoever placed, and to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery. The following is a story of what happened in California. Right after the conquest of the Valley of Mexico, uh, there was a debate erupted whether Indians were human beings or not. Philosophers and scholars in Spain argued that they were natural born slaves, not capable of understanding the complexities of Catholicism and Christianity. See, Spain based their, their, their ownership and the right to do this on something called a papal bull of 1493, the year after Columbus discovered the new world for Europe. They, the, the, the Pope said, okay, Spain gets to have North America and part of South America and Portugal gets the rest. So by the swipe of a pen, we have a pope giving away our property. When they entered here, I think it was the beginning of the end of the Kauai people here as far as our culture went, because everything was destroyed by them. When they brought cattle in here, thousands of cattle and horses and things, and they destroyed the very food that was for the Indian people. And this is never written anywhere. There's never told how they suffered in their own land. But probably the most uh, devastating was the introduced diseases. And we're talking about children's diseases like measles, mumps, chicken pox, not even to mention the horrendous ones like smallpox and diphtheria, uh, venereal diseases. And people became afraid. Their children were sick and dying. In all epidemic diseases, it is the children and the elders who die first. Sadly, uh, kind of a, a situation where your past and your future are dying right before your eyes. In the spring of 1769, Father Junipero Serra, accompanied by the Spanish military, sailed into San Diego Harbor and established California's first mission. Over the next 50 years, the Spaniards built 20 other missions along the coast to colonize the land and pacify the Indians. When Father Serra arrived, there were approximately 340,000 Indians in California. By the turn of the century, only 17,000 remained. And then when they started the, the missions here, well, that was worse yet because there were all Indian slaves that built those missions. And, the, and I remember my, my father was telling me one time, he said, you know, his great-great-uncle and his uncle before that, his, also his great-great-uncle was telling them that he was one that was kidnapped and taken into one of the missions. They went to church every day. They had routines of prayers and labor every day. And, and Floyd, remember this, most of these Indians could not speak Spanish. The mass is delivered in Latin. At, the, at several missions, explorers came by and reported, uh, English and French explorers reported that, that the Indians are made to kneel on the tiles. There was no benches. They're made to kneel on the tiles and lay, remain motionless during the entire mass, by the way, with armed guards with fixed bayonets the corner. This is not the image that we have of the missions that 
you go to so visit today. They were forced today. to listen, forced to be there. They had no to. choice. They had no choice, and they would be punished if they did not uh, go there. If they, if they ran off, uh, they were not allowed to run off. And I don't know how, by luck, he got a run away from there again and went home. And he said, you know what they are doing to our people? And the, the people were wondering, and he said, they made us do this, and he would kneel down, and if we didn't do that, that whip us, then you had to become that, or otherwise you're going to be killed. And we had to make that with the cross. They, he didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know anything about it. Then they were whipped, and they were, they were not given any food. They had to be hungry all the time. He said, that's what they're doing to my people over there. There have been very careful studies done of the Spanish records, looking at the kind of food that the Indians were being given and calculating the number of calories per day that they were probably receiving. On average, it's less than 1,000 calories a day. Um, in many missions, the numbers they figure it's somewhere between six and 700 calories per day. Let me put this in some context. On, on slave plantations in the South, the field slaves working in the fields were getting, according to contemporary analyses, approximately four to 45, 4,000 to 4,500 calories a day. Now, that's a lot of calories. But it's a lot of calories because you're working like a slave. You need, you need that kind of caloric intake in order to do slave labor. Mm -hmm. The Indians were doing slave labor also, but they're getting six and seven hundred, maybe a thousand calories a day. That's a big difference. It's a huge difference. They're starving to death. They're working them to death and starving them to death. Make another comparison. In the final year or so of uh, the Buchenwald concentration camp in Nazi Germany, um, there again have been calculations of the amount of caloric intake that the inmates received. It was around six to seven hundred calories a day. That's I can't remember exactly, something like a cup of milk and a little and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a piece of bread or something. That is what the, the people in the missions were getting year after year after year, decade after decade after decade. They were literally being starved. But I think it's important also, Floyd, that we acknowledge that these Indians weren't just victims, as they responded in numerous ways. The very first mission here in San Diego was attacked within the first two weeks of the arrival of the Spanish. And in 1775, a force of nearly 1,200 local Kumeyaay Indians sacked and burned Mission San Diego. They didn't have a convert here for two years. Having survived the Spanish onslaught, the worst was yet to come. In 1848, gold was discovered in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada. Settlers and immigrants flooded into the region from the east. For the second time in less than a century, California Indians encountered a people who claimed to have divine right to their land. This time, the resulting genocide was in the name of manifest destiny. In, in the process of searching for this goal, the attitude for the native people at that time was honed to precision. And that was the mentality of nits make lice. The only good Indian is a dead Indian. Uh, and this thing standing between America and progress had to be erased somehow. They went all over California from the Siskiyou Alps all the way south into the Cuyamacas here in San Diego County. They worked everywhere and they disrupted Indian lives everywhere they went. It was an entirely lawless situation. Floyd, there was undescribable violence towards the Indian people. Uh, Indian children were stolen, little girls were made into sex slaves, little boys into servants, parents were murdered, Indian villages were burnt down, principally at the hands of militias. These militias were just organized gangs of killers that went out without any legal authority. Even the military at times couldn't stand the assault of the vigilantes on the native people and sometimes they'd stop that but very often and too often they'd just look turn the other way and it, it it was like that all all over even up to northern california they would uh, give them poisoned uh, roast cattle and things and the indian people just died left and right they hunted their heads they paid so much for indian head fifty dollars to ten dollars whatever they were all, you always had to bring in the, the head of the Indian that you killed. That's what they did to the people here in California. 
This went on for the first two years of the gold rush at such an intense pace that 100,000 Indians died in the first two years of the gold rush. Floyd, nothing like this happened anywhere else in North America. Nothing like this was comparable to the loss of life and the utter chaos and violence of the gold rush. If that was perpetrated by civilians, it's very much like ethnic cleansing at its height in this country. It's one of the uglier chapters of ethnic cleansing in North American Indian history and probably stands in world history as an outstanding example of the cruelty of human beings to one another. When gold played out, the slaughter continued as attention shifted to ownership of the land. Echoing the sentiment of the public, the press called for the extermination of the red man. Volunteers, the the, um, uh, the guards and Pit River Rangers. They had several different names for the people in California who organized on their own to go out and basically kill Indians and help the military clear the land. One of the most disturbing things that I ever came across in the documentation was the inaugural address of California's first governor when he declared that Indians that a war of extermination would be made against the Indians until the Indian race is extinct. We've got a classic example of the head of the modern state endorsing genocide. Sometimes we, when we hear the word Stanford, we think, boy, that's the best university there, there ever was, and it may be. But when Leland Stanford was the governor of California, the militia out there killing Native people, they got paid and rifle powder and ball for killing Indians. That was their reward. The militias were financed at first by local merchants who simply saw an advantage of, of getting rid of the local Indians. Uh, then they would submit the bill to the state legislature since the state legislature was, had barely formed and they were clamoring for protection for, against Indian depredations as they called it. The state legislature paid them back and then sent the bill to the federal government and the federal government reimbursed eventually over one and a half million dollars for militia campaigns against Indians. Now, the, the, the great tragedy in this is that this becomes a form of subsidized murder. The townspeople of Eureka decided that they wanted to take it. And one night, February 26, 1860, they came quietly, silently. They left their guns at home and they brought clubs and hatchets. They came while they were sleeping, and the men were gone, and they killed the women and children and the elders. So the island is bloody, and there was a baby found on that island in 1860, the morning of, after the, the massacre took place. And that baby was Jerry James, and he was my great-great-grandfather. It was public policy to take my scalp. It was public policy to take my ear. Public policy even to take my head and sell it to California's government for five bucks. And we're standing at this rock here where it says uh, Bloody Island, scene of a battle between the U.S. soldiers under command of Captain Lyons and Indians under Chief Augustine. This battle that they're calling was actually a massacre of our people here on Venapati. And it started with, uh, with these two men from um, the Sonoma area called Charles Stone and Andrew Kelsey. They bought some land from uh, Vallejo, General Vallejo, and came up here and brought their cows and settled in the area over there by Canuctai, uh, the town that they call Kelseyville now. They treated the Indians real bad. They, they would uh, enslave them. They made them build fences around their own village so they couldn't go hunting or gathering. And they wanted complete control. They would tell the parents, bring your little girls to our house, the Stone and Kelsey. 
and the parents would, and if they refused, they would get hung in a tree and they would get whipped and left there all night for punishment. They were treated so bad and starving that they went and killed Charles Stone and Andrew Kelsey. And for killing them, Ben Kelsey uh, heard about it and he got 15 vigilantes together, uh, which one of the vigilantes was the governor of California, William Boggs. Uh, there was lawyers, there were businessmen, I mean, it was just, you know, regular citizens got together and they came over here just to kill and revenge what happened to Andrew Kelsey and Charles Stone. One of the few survivors of this massacre was Lucy Moore, the great-grandmother of Clayton Duncan. The reason why she survived was because of a game that the kids played around here in the Tulis, a hide-and-go-seek game. They would take a reed and they would uh, hide under the water and breathe through this reed while, you know, they would be hiding. And it was kind of hard to, you know, find a little brown kid in a, in a bunch of tulies, you know, breathing through the reed under the water. And so she knew that game. And uh, when this battle happened, when this butchering happened, well, that's what she done. She took this reed. Her mother told her to get a reed. She got under the water and she started breathing through the reed. And that's how she survived. Many of the people who survived were forced onto reservations or sold into slavery to provide free labor in the mines and on the ranches. Over 4,000 children were bought and sold at markets at prices ranging from $60 for a boy to $200 for a girl. Enslaved women and girls were sold for higher prices because the miners and ranchers used them for forced sexual labor. The California state government paid $1 million for scalping missions in 1851 and 1852. Militias were paid $5 for a severed Indian head in Shasta in 1855, and 25 cents for a scalp in Honey Lake in 1863. One of the things that my father always uh, talked to me about was when uh, most of our the Kauia people were almost destroyed completely here when uh, when Chief uh, Juan Antonio protected the, the non-Indians and fought for them and he realized that we would never defeat the white man that was coming in. He realized that and he didn't want his people to die and then he helped those people and he protected them. In turn, the army sent in infected smallpox blankets and he killed about 60 percent of the Kauia people at that time. The other records and where would yes, you... Yes, you know, this is one of the things. I belong to the Riverside Historical Society. And after I uh, got out of there, my brother took place, and my brother and I and my family still speak the language. And he took over, and he found out what happened. They said, you know what, this is what they did to Juan Antonio and all of my people. And they, and they said, oh, no, that has to be documented before we can really put it out. So they went and looked over it, and they got in Washington. It is documented that they did send the blankets here, the army blankets to the people here. Was there the documented form of letters, and military I think records? So, yes. The military records. They went through that. And that's why they have that uh, uh, plaque now right there by the rest area uh -huh. of, to, John, uh, to Juan Antonio. And then my brother put that up with the help of all the people that belong to that historical society in Riverside. We are Ask me about um, what kind of people could do the kinds of things we've talked about that the Europeans did to the indigenous people. It, it, it boggles the mind to think of the psychopathology that can go into this kind of thing. But what clearly happens in these situations is an ideology has been created that these individuals work within that says that those people are less than human. When I was in graduate school, I was a classmate with a man who was on leave from the United States Navy. He was the most high ranking African American in the United States Navy. He was a captain, then he became an admiral. And he and I used to talk about the Pequot War because he was writing on the Pequot War. And he, would, he got very emotional talking about what the Puritans had done to the Indians and how they had dehumanized them in order to kill them because he said that's what he had done. 
as a naval officer in Vietnam commanding a fleet of ships that were shelling villages all up and down the coast of Vietnam, not knowing who they're killing. They're killing babies, they're killing women, they're killing old people, they're killing civilians. They don't care. He doesn't care. He said, I never even thought about their lives because they were just gooks. They were just dehumanized things. If I'd ever could have seen what I was doing and thought of them as human beings, I couldn't live with myself for it. But I had been trained to dehumanize them, and so I did. And that's exactly what happens over and over again. It's what's happening in Kosovo, it's what's happening, happened in Cambodia, it happened in Rwanda, uh, it happened in Nazi Germany, and it happened here in California and across the whole continent. And it wasn't just the native people who were being really annihilated in some of this. You know, claim jumpers, you shoot a claim jumper. So that happened a lot in the gold area. Some, sometimes the white people would be killing white people. If somebody just walked on their land, they claimed. So there was a lot of other killing going on, too. So killing was terrible. One ploy, one thing that they would do to, I don't know, make them feel better or something. If some new person, for instance, would move in or near Round Valley, uh, American, where they may go over and burn his house down. And then they leave bows and arrows there, which is an indication that the Indians attacked this settler, which gave them better excuse to go down the reservation and just start killing it. Killing is some, is some kind of a disease, I think. If you start killing, maybe you can't stop. You know, like a dog starts killing chicken. I don't think you can stop that dog from killing chickens anymore. You've got to do something to the dog or get rid of the chicken. But basically, I think that thing gets in human beings, too. A very evil spirit invades, becomes paramount, becomes paramount. It takes over. One of the deal about the government, too, to send all the children away to government schools so they could lose their culture, lose their language. And that's what they did. Most of those that went to these schools have lost the language, and when they came back, they could hardly talk or didn't even know it anymore because they were too young. And, and not only that, when you're um, restricted, uh, your lifestyle's changing, you're restricted, uh, you can't go hunting, you're not supposed to go walking in the mountains, you're not supposed to go gather any food, you're not supposed to, you're not supposed to cross a white man's f field out here to go get some medicine to go have your ceremony, or you're not supposed to do it, you get no trespassing everywhere, causes you to your whole spirit to atrophy. When your spirit atrophies, it gives up on your body, and your body deteriorates, and it turns very soft. And instead of running and climbing mountains and hunting and fishing and making baskets and gathering material, things like that, and people are basically watch television sometimes and sometimes have a job, and a lot of times not have a job, but continue that very poor diet because we're left out of the economy you know, we're left out of the economy chain. We're not supposed to have anything. We're not supposed to appreciate anything. We're not supposed to love each other. We're not supposed to have emotions. We're not supposed to, these things aren't supposed to, we're not supposed to have tender feelings. We're not supposed to have those things. We're supposed to be savage. We're supposed to be crude. We're supposed to be like a caveman mentality. And that's what they keep telling us. They keep telling our children. That's why I work with children. That's why you work with children. Because we've got to get that out. Get that out of the textbooks. Get that out of their thinking. Get that out of their heart. And get that out of their mind. Because their mind is very powerful. I think it's real bad for all of us, all of you in this room, to see yourselves as victims of history. Uh, when you, when you, once you put the mantle of victim on, you become helpless. And that's exactly the way the government has liked us. The reason they're so damn upset about the, the casinos is that suddenly you get money, Indians with money and everybody's upset because Indians are, they're so much more attractive when they're poor and helpless and dependent. Remember Andrew Jackson? He said, annihilate the Indian from the face of the earth. See, but we're still here, we're so persistent. But that's what you happened. You cannot kill a people No, spirit, because, and the spirit will no, is there. And, and you know when they said we want you to assimilate into the the dominant society. We can't because we have our own ways. We have our own religion. We can't join them. We can learn their language and do whatever they do, but we can't become a part of them. It's impossible. Everybody has an umbilical cord attached to their mother, but you also have a spiritual umbilical cord, the ehlo. The ehlo attaches from your, where your where your belly button is, to the center of the earth, to the center of the universe. And that's exactly where you're supposed to be, according to your halo. So they have this very strong halo. You can stretch it, but you couldn't break it.
I think the beautiful part of my history is, yes, my elders knew what they lost. They lost their homelands, they lost their culture, they lost their language, and, and everything they possibly ever dreamed of was gone. But yet they held on to the hope and believe that someday for their children, their grandchildren, their great-great-grandchildren, not yet born, there would be a better time that the culture and, the, and everything that they lost would come back around and return. They believed in these things wholeheartedly. And I'm fortunate enough to see a small part of this come to pass and come, you know, come true. That I have this heritage to pass down to the young people that I work with. So it's beautiful. And even what's happening right now, sitting in front of this camera, we'll be able to reach out to people in the far dark areas of, of the world. And to be able to record the life and history of our elders. It's a beautiful prophecy that's coming to pass. And once again, Floyd, thank you for this opportunity. One of the final acts of the Holocaust against Indians in the California story was the 1863 roundup and death march to the largest concentration camp in California, the Round Valley Reservation. Located in Northern California, this concentration camp was created to hold several Indian nations. They were the Yuki, Konkau Maidu, Little Lake, and other Pomo, Nome Lackey, Kahot, Wailaki and Pitt River. Whenever an Indian killed a white settler or miner, it created an excuse for militias to go down to the reservation and shoot any amount of Indians, including elders, women, and children, as retribution. This happened so often that Round Valley became known as the abattoir or the slaughter area. This overview is a contemporary picture of how the Holocaust still exists today. Indians have been decimated throughout history. They were left to languish in concentration camps while the rest of the country grew and prospered. Indians were being written off as roadkill cultures of manifest destiny. Before living in concentration camps, Indians had a perfect diet. In the concentration camps, they were forced to survive on government subsidies of flour, lard, sugar, salt, and canned meats. Often these meat products were contaminated. As a result of that diet, diabetes is prevalent in most Indian nations today. Today, Indians live with many forms of institutional racism. The movie industry continues to ridicule and stereotype Indians and their culture while movies that denigrate African Americans and Hispanics are no longer there, those depicting Indian stereotypes can still be seen daily on television. This becomes a type of residual Holocaust that we live with today. Another form of residual Holocaust is racism in sports. Racism exists in all levels of sports today in their use of mascots. While there are no teams called Pittsburgh Negroes or New Jersey Jews, Indian people have to live with Washington Redskins, Cleveland Indians, Arcadia Apaches, 
and their insulting caricatures. Indians are further ignored as the rightful owners of this country. Having lost their culture and land, much like the victims of the Jewish Holocaust, Indians have lost their land and culture through the ruthless dominating efforts of America in the name of God, freedom, and democracy. Who will speak for the rightful owners of this land? When America goes to war with the nation and is victorious, it implements plans to help rebuild those defeated nations. Who will help rebuild the Indian nations that have been decimated and continue to exist in their present conditions? There is a moral challenge to the civilized world to address the issue of land and cultural retrieval for Indian people. There is a healing that needs to take place in America. America needs to heal from its violent past or it will continue as it does today. In the aftermath of the Nazi Holocaust and World War II, German political leaders, military officers, and the German people were put on trial before the Nuremberg Tribunal. All were charged with war crimes, high crimes against humanity and genocide, and all proclaimed their innocence. Military officers said they were only following orders. Political leaders and the German people proclaimed innocence by saying they had no idea what was going on in the concentration camps. To their protests of innocence, U.S. Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackson who was the chief U.S. prosecutor at Nuremberg, responded to their protests of innocence by saying, certain acts and violations of treaties are crimes. They are crimes whether Germany commits them or whether the United States commits them. We are not prepared to impose a code of criminal conduct against others that we would not be willing to have invoked against us.